And so tonight, I just want to go ahead and hop in our show. Um, we have not done a show on on bail reform, and um, we have a guest with us tonight. Um, we have uh, Ken Good with us tonight. Um, Ken, welcome to the show, man. Hey, well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Um, Ken, Ken Good is, uh, uh, I guess you, I would be proper to say you're out of Tyler. You have offices in Tyler and Houston. Is that right? That's right. Um, graduating from um, Hardin-Simmons University in 1982 with a Bachelor of Arts degree. You received your Master's of Education degree in 1986 from Tarleton State University, um, which is an uh, extension of Texas A&M system. And in 89, uh, you received your law degree from the Texas Tech School of Law, um, where you're a member of the Texas Tech Law Review. Um, you've argued cases before the Supreme Court um, of Texas and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, along with uh, numerous courts of uh, courts of appeals, including the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. And you um, are married, and we were just discussing off camera, you have uh, two daughters. Is that all accurate? It is. It is. My wife is also an attorney. She's a staff attorney for a federal uh, magistrate judge here in Tyler. And so uh, I learned very early in my uh, marriage that you do not co uh, quote case law to your wife in bed. Oh, my gosh. I bet that is that's like um, uh, a, a cop marrying a cop. I've always said uh, I've had uh, plenty of opportunities to to date uh, police officers. And I said, I, I can't do that because I don't feel like that would really go together. So that's very interesting to hear that uh, you, you are married to an attorney as well. Yeah, we mesh really well. I used to, I used to say that uh, we we're opposites attract. She's a very I'm very outgoing. She's an introvert, but I really don't think that anymore. I think the gel that keeps us together is we both are very, uh, we have strong religious beliefs. And so I think that's what brought us together and that's what keeps us together. Absolutely. And um, tell me a little bit about you. So you are a bail reform attorney. Is that correct? Yes. So, you know, going through my educational background, you already know I'm as ancient as there is. Uh, I'm an old, old geezer. Uh, I've been practicing law for over 30 years. But uh, so I started out as an attorney representing doctors and hospitals when they got sued. Uh, I've always had an interest in appellate work and going to the courts of appeals and arguing issues. And I've argued a lot of those issues. But sometime around 20, 25 years ago, I got um, pulled into this area of the law representing uh, uh, bail issues. And to, uh, the cases I've argued at the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals are on the issues of bail. And so uh, I've kind of specialized in that since then. And then when this bail reform movement started, uh, I attended a hearing very early on, and I discovered that the judge in my opinion, didn't know what she was talking about and was going off track and uh, the case was going to go south. And so I came out setting off the alarm for our industry and saying we need to become experts on these issues. And I set out to do that, to become knowledgeable and to know what was going on and be familiar with the law and the facts. And I think that's really uh, been helpful because since then, that judge that I sit in on in the very first hearing, I think she's been reversed seven, eight, or nine times uh, to prove that she she was wrong. And um, and so, but the harm that she's done to the bail uh, industry or criminal justice system nationwide uh, is still being felt to this day. So can you, uh, just a, a pretty direct question, I guess, um, you talk about bail reform what is your opinion on that? What is it that you think needs to change and what is your what is your position? Well, I think we're always looking for how to improve the criminal justice system. And you know, pretrial release, bail, the bail system is one of those uh, types of things that we're always looking for ways to improve it. What I uh, what Okay, so let me set it up by quoting a mayor from uh, Durham, North Dakota. She was on a News Nation uh, town hall on crime, and she said, until you have an alternative to the private industry bail system that has the same low failure to appear rate and the same high level of accountability, you don't have an alternative. 
to the private industry. And so my position on bail is we have a lot of people pushing for what I call bail, uh, bad bail reform because they're pushing alternatives that are really not alternatives because they carry high failure to appear rates and they uh, and they get rid of accountability. That creates chaos, that creates de facto cr- decriminalization and gives a green light for e- groups that y'all well know, um, organized crime, career criminals and gangs to just take off, see that as a green light to commit a lot of crime and make a ton of money. And and I can stand behind um, that. We we were, uh, me and Preston were talking um, before before the show, and we were kind of preparing. And some of our th- my thought process, and and uh, you you can, you know, chime in and, and give your thoughts and opinion. Uh, we welcome all kinds of opinions on this show. Um, across the board, you, for example, I told him I said I could go tonight and. And I used uh, maybe not the best charge in the world, but I used prostitution. So I could get arrested in Dallas County tonight for prostitution and say my bail will be set at, say, $1,000 or $5,000 or any variation in between. And then I can go to Smith County where you and I are are both from, and I could get arrested for uh, prostitution there. And my bail will be, say, set at $100,000 and say this is my first offense. I've never been arrested before. Um, so why is there such a vast difference between county to county and, 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 and state to state and, and how bail is set? It is, it's such a wide, uh, difference. Well, I think part of the problem is politics. Um, especially when you go state to state, uh, bail is regulated by states. And then, uh, in Texas, the, the reason why you have such disparities in bail is because the judges are in charge of bail and judges set bail based on a, um, an abuse of discretion standard. So that means that the defendant can file a motion to reconsider bail at any time. If they don't think the judges, uh, acted in, uh, correctly, they could file a petition for writ of habeas corpus. And so, uh, the, the way the law is written in Texas is we have a broad, dis- uh, discretion for the trial courts to set bail. Uh, and so that's the reason why it would be different from one county to another. So, you know, a rural county is going to set one standard, and but an urban county is going to set another because they their jails are usually full. And so they're going to set a lower bail because they, they don't have room for them in the county jail. Uh, I think that probably has some some uh, uh, effect on uh, what, the, what they're doing. But I think probably the biggest thing is uh, – the judge, whether the judge is a law and order judge, it's the bail is going to be higher uh, because they're going to be a no nonsense judge. The bail is going to be higher, and if uh, and if they're and with politics right now, you know, we've got some arguments being made that no matter how many times you commit the crime of prostitution or uh, solicitation of prostitution, you will be released on the same amount of bond. Uh, no matter how long your criminal history is. I disagree that there's anybody in Texas that's a first-time offender that's stuck in jail because they can't afford a bond anymore. I I just don't believe that, especially for misdemeanors. Not today, not after what we've been through for the last four years, Um, and especially the way crime has gone up. So I, I, I think that if you, but once you have a criminal history, if they set your bail and you can't afford it, well, you're not in jail because you're poor, then you're in jail because you have a criminal history. And I think that's a completely different situation. Yeah. So something that you, you touched on there, um, you know, the, the, the magistrate's the one who sets the bill. Mm-hmm. I I have a kind of an issue, I guess, right now with uh, understanding the, uh, the concept of you have, you know, in, in Texas, I know, some of the magistrates that that are in you know that do the arraignment for some counties or municipalities they're just appointed magistrates by whatever governing body that is and it's not necessarily you know i I feel like the way the system is supposed to be designed is you know the the magistrates and in the criminal justice system once you get into the court procedures the people who are going to be deciding on you know whether you're innocent or guilty, or what your what your um, your sentencing should be, or a jury of your peers, or a magistrate. So when it comes to the magistrate, how is the person, the magistrate that's setting 
these bill amounts, um, magistrates that aren't elected and maybe some of them are just appointed or some, you know, I've seen some county jails where they hire magistrates mm -hmm. specifically to do the arraignment and it's not a, an elected magistrate. You know, the, the people aren't deciding who's arraigning them, who's setting these bills. If that, if that makes any sense, I, I just think that there's a little, like you said, some politics play with that, but. We know that the term magistrate can be a verb or a noun. I mean, it's, it sounds so crazy, but you know, the people who can magistrate somebody is anyone from mayor all the way to the chief justice of the Supreme court of Texas can be a magistrate. Um, or they can do what we call you know, a verb magistrating, they can magistrate somebody once they're arrested. But in our urban cities, we have gotten into this area, like you, like you mentioned, where we're just hiring people. That's all they do is magistrate all day long. They never try cases. They just set bail all day long. They do initial appearances all day long. And I've heard that same point that you've made is why do we have somebody who's not responsible to the voters set bail? Well, in Texas, every county that has a magistrate, there's a statute authorizing it. So there's the state legislature has authorized that county to hire magistrates. Like Harris County right now has magistrates, and that's probably the most uh, uh, political right now. It's, and uh, they have a rule in place where if you're – that's a charge-based release. So if you're arrested for these list of crimes, you're going to get a $100 PR bond, period, no matter how many times you do it. Commit it. You can commit it five, eight, ten times. You're still going to get a hundred dollar uh, personal bond because it's a charge based release system. And no matter how many times you fail to appear, you're still going to get that one hundred dollar personal bond because it's a charge based release system. And I think those are all imposed by local rules. And some some of it's political, but you know some of it is just the reality. So in Harris County, before you know there were all these lawsuits. <laughs> They used a bail schedule to get people through the system quickly. And when they set those aside, they've replaced them with what we call a simple simple release, which is they're releasing them for this charge base uh, uh, based on what their charge is. And that does not work. That it fills up your jails. Their jail is full right now. You don't have any uh, accountability for low-level crimes. Your low-level crimes are now the training grounds for felon future felonies. And your jail's full of felonies. So... Um, but you, you, you know, th this could be a, a much more difficult issue because among the states, we have different types of bail systems, uh, release mechanisms, like, um, and I would divide them into two categories uh, uh, detain or release, which is kind of the federal system where we're just going to detain you or we're going to release you. The problem is, when they reformed the federal system to switch over to this, they at the time they switched, they had a they were holding twenty five percent of the people arrested. Now they hold seventy five percent of the people arrested, and you can imagine that if Texas tried to go to a, a detain or release system, and we held fifty percent of the people that were arrested, we can't. We don't have enough capacity. We don't have enough jail space to do that. And so that we can't do a release or detain system. And we have a lot of people that are pushing for that in Texas because they know we don't have the capacity. And, and remember, when you don't have the ability to do it, that creates chaos, creates chaos, creates de facto decriminalization. De facto decriminalization is a green light to commit more crime. And so you have all these motivations going on. And so when you're looking at what they're advocating you have to look at the impact of it and and you have to you know go go to the deep dive on what they're really doing because a lot of these policies that are being proposed are really just to create chaos de facto criminalization and get pe people out of jail uh, they don't want them to be held they don't want them to be held guilty they just they don't want there to be that crime be uh, against that person and 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 the problem the problem is the people they're trying to help ends up being the same uh, racial group that's hurt the most because when crime goes up, it goes up disproportionately in, in minority communities. It goes up faster in minority communities. So the people they're trying to help end up hurting, getting hurt the most. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there for sure. Um, 
Well, so we have to find the sweet spot. What will get people to come to court and what will get them with the lowest failure to appear rate and have a high level of accountability. And, 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 you know, as a lot of different studies have shown, there's nothing that will even compare with the private industry. And if you can even go to California during the pandemic and they found that there was a difference on people simply released versus released on a private surety. And, and what they found was on nonviolent offenders, people released on uh, no bond, on simple release, had a 200% greater chance of committing a violent offense in the next 18 months. Now, I mean, if we're just looking at that kind of numbers, why would we want to release anybody on uh, just a simple release, personal bond, no bond, whatever you want to call it, if they that then that alone says they've got a 200% greater chance of committing a violent offense in the ne next 18 months? It's just crazy. Yeah, I, I think there's there is a fine line there. Uh, like you said, uh, I believe your words were finding the sweet spot because it, committing crime, sh if you're actually committing a crime, it should not be okay. And if you're getting a low enough bail set to where you're not worried about it because either your friends or family or yourself have the money sitting in the account, you can just bail yourself right out and then so okay well that's not a big deal that's just a misdemeanor theft i'm just going to keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it um my question would be as far as misdemeanors uh how do you i mean what's the answer there you know what is that sweet spot what what is it that um I guess you were proposing or you're, or you're trying well, to. Well, you know, I think that uh, Hidalgo County here in um, in Texas has a, a pretty good pr program. And that is, you know, if you get a personal bond and you mess up, you're not going to get another personal bond. I mean, in Harris County, we have examples of people getting personal bonds 15, 16 or more times. And that's when we say, well, there's no accountability. So if you want to try somebody on a personal bond, even though it has a substantially higher failure to appear rate, um, and that means their case will have to be put, put on hold until they return. And a lot of times that means they have to commit a new crime because, you know, that means that that's when their warrant's checked. So they commit a new crime. So they find a warrant and they arrest them. Uh, but if you overlay on top of that a, a, a a dose of accountability so that if you screw up or you mess up, you don't get another personal bond uh, and your bond gets double, then then the system is not going to be harmed too much by doing these personal bonds, which I agree have to be an option to protect the poor. But what we're doing is we're replacing a system that works very well and we're replacing it with a system that does not work. And that's where the problem is when you take away all accountability. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. Um, yeah, I, I've, I'll be honest, I've, I've never really thought this in depth and uh, on bonds and things like that. Um, but it's, it's definitely a. Uh, well, you know, we we, okay. So here's what some of the the people from the other side argue. It's like, well, hey, man, you're you've been arrested. I mean, we've already used the example of of. Uh, uh, prostitution and you haven't been convicted of a crime. So why should you be required to post a bond? You, the presumption of innocence applies. The problem is that has nothing to do with setting bail. Bail is what assurance are you going to give the court that you will return to answer the criminal charges that have been brought against you? And if you can't give the court assurance that you will return, or if the court doesn't think you will return, or you have a track history of not returning, uh, then the court can just deny you bail. I mean, especially uh, we have some charges in our Texas Constitution where they can just detain you. But we also have other examples or situations where you just you you breach a court's order. So they say, no, I'm not going to let you. I'm, I'm going to revoke your bond and I'm going to put you in jail. And so the whole purpose of bail is is what assurance are you going to give to court that you're going to return to answer your charge? And that's the problem we're having. We have all these uh, groups on the left uh, advocating to replace it with a system that doesn't work. And, and they argue these really, you know, soothing arguments. Oh, everybody wants to get their case resolved. Everybody will 
you know, come to court anyway. Well, no, the pandemic proved that's wrong. I mean, I did a podcast with a, with a DA from California. They used simple release for all misdemeanors in California. Their failure to peer rate on misdemeanors in California is 80%. If you look in Harris County, the, the police officers union did a review of the dockets for one week and found a 75% failure to peer rate. Another group, HarrisCountyCourtWatch.com, reviewed the, the, uh, Harris County District Clerk's uh, data for two years and found an average of an 80% failure to peer rate on misdemeanors in Harris County. So, um, and we already know if they don't come to court 80% of the time, that means those cases have to be put on hold till they come back. And and here's the damage it does. You know, uh, the criminal justice system is is like a conveyor belt. Every month, every day, the same average number of cases are being added to it. And in our urban areas, those are large numbers. And if you can't get the cases resolved, so you have a thousand people show supposed scheduled to show up for a week, and you have an eighty percent failure to peer rate, that means the next week you have eighteen hundred people who have to come to court. And if you have another eighty percent, the next week it just keeps compounding and compounding, and that's how you get chaos. That's how you get uh, de facto decriminalization because that. That's the only thing that prevents the criminal justice system from collapse, and that's why it gets perceived as a green light to commit more crime. And that's what we can't have. We have to have a layer of accountability when someone doesn't show up for court. And if we if we take that away and people start perceiving that as a green light for crime, then it, the jails are full with very dangerous people, and we have no room to to uh, uh, to apply accountability to misdemeanor crimes. And I'm like, well, then why do we have misdemeanor courts if we're not going to have accountability? So, because I've, I've um, you know, I've, I've personally been present um, during conversations about some district attorneys in, in the state of Texas, uh, well, I guess they're already doing it, but um, wanting to authorize for like a local police department, like the agency I work with, we don't, we don't have our own, um, you know, I work for a small municipality, so we don't have our own jail. We use the county. Um, that usually ties up a lot of resources when, you know, we make an arrest, you're, that's, that's a good hour plus that you're going to have an officer outside of the city limits, uh, taking somebody to, to county. So, you know, there's, there's been some talks about, well, if it's a misdemeanor and it's not a violent crime, maybe just like property crimes or something like that, that we'll set up a booking station inside, um, you know, police departments can set up booking stations and just go ahead and process them and release them. Just yeah, can, issue a citation. And, and, and then, and then file, you know, and then that gets sent over to the DA and I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking like, well, haven't we been doing something similar to, similar to that? Uh, it's called filing at large with the DA's office. Like I've done that multiple times throughout my career. So I don't understand what the, I don't, I don't understand what, what you're accomplishing other than not putting, not filling up the jail. Well, you still run into the same problem because if you catch and release, then uh, you have to have. At some point, a warrant issued with a bail set on that warrant, right? Well, when you catch and release, you're giving them an appearance date. And then if they don't show up, your only choice is to either reschedule or issue a warrant. Like and right. if you issue a warrant, you're in the same spot you were originally. And that's the problem. A site and release has a terrible failure to appear rate. Right? And so you're you're starting out. I mean, it's just like a, a personal bond. I mean, all you're doing is skipping having to send somebody over to the county jail to do the paperwork. But you're already starting that criminal case out with a high failure to appear rate, which actually, if you're going to put accountability into the system, puts the defendant in a worse situation than they started with, because then they immediately come back with a failure to appear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, and it's, we want to try to, uh, we don't want to start off by setting you up for failure. Right. Like, so you, oh, I think that's a great point. That's a great point. If we're setting you up for failure, yeah, that's right. You don't want us to set you up for failure at the very beginning of your criminal case. Yeah. So you, you've, you've committed a crime, you've been arrested. So let me continue to send you down a, a path that's going to fail you. There is no, there is no justice in that, in my, in my opinion. 
Um, well, but you know, look at California where we've now decriminalized theft under nine hundred fifty dollars. And, you know, we started out, I mean, that was a proposition that was presented to the voters and it wasn't presented as we're going to decriminalize theft. It was presented as we're going to change these crimes from felonies to misdemeanors, and that will help people get work. Uh, They'll still have to answer for the misdemeanor. The problem is in our urban areas in California, after that passed, they said, well, we're no longer going to prosecute those crimes. So that was decriminalization. We're not going to prosecute theft under $950. And what has been the impact? I mean, we talk about, well, it's a nonviolent offense. Well, I think it's pretty violent when you have department stores across the, you know, these urban yeah, areas. It's, a, it's, an imp- it's an impact on the economy. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. How, how are these businesses recovering? I mean, I know they probably have insurance, et cetera, et cetera, but it's, it's no, still, but it's, at some point, you just, you kick it down the line and it's still, um, a, 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 it runs into an issue. It's not necessarily a victimless crime because it does impact the economy. I think it's, it's, it, it is a, uh, it, it is a crime that has like, it's like the bowling ball knocking over more and more pins because you start out with, it, you know, the businesses get hurt, businesses close, then they, the tax property values go down. I mean, look in San Francisco, uh, uh, California, they're selling buildings, commercial properties for a third of their value two years ago. I mean, one of the biggest buildings that, uh, in, uh, in Wash, in, in the state of Washington, they're trying to sell it for a third of the value, which is what the mortgage currently is on it. I mean, these are, and they're trying to say, oh, it's because of COVID. It's because of pe- more people working from home. No, it's because of crime. I mean, look at the Nancy Pelosi Federal Building in San Francisco. They told the federal workers in that building to quit coming to work, work from home, because it's not safe to park your car in the neighborhood or wa- walk from your car to the building. It's not safe to go to work, so work from home. If you can't provide a safe workplace for your employees, your property value is going to drop, your taxes, your tax base is going to drop. You're seeing mayors come out and def- you know ch- call for change because they're the ones that are going to lose the tax revenue and ultimately the buildings will commit uh, will default and then cities will start defaulting. And and you think oh this will never happen. No, it, we are on track in San Francisco and other cities for that very thing to happen. There's been articles in the last 2 weeks about it. Yeah, so, you know, so right out the gate I think my my response to uh, to build reform across the board is that, and, and and I do I do understand where you know you you want to take into consideration people who can't afford it right um, can't afford to to post bail or or a bond so um, yeah but what the case law says is people who can't afford it the Constitution requires them to be given an opportunity to ask for a deviation a change. So once you give them that opportunity, if the judge says, okay, I've looked at your criminal history, I've looked at you, I've looked at the way you move around, I'm not changing it. You had your opportunity. The constitutional requirements were met. What what the problem is, we have people arguing that they have a constitutional right to release, and there's been no court that's held that. In fact, the courts of appeals that have addressed it have rejected that argument. And so, and then we still have the left still making those arguments, or we have one side of the electorate still making those arguments, even though they've been rejected by the courts. I, so, did you want to finish your thought? Because well, I, I have a question too, but go ahead and finish your yeah, thought. Yeah. So, so on that note, if it, It sounds like you. Each state is setting the tone of, um, I guess what would be constitutional or not, um, and, and going against that. That, that I, I think each law. state each state has sets has the floor of the constitution to meet, and then after that they can do whatever they want. Is what the way I would say it is. They have to comply with the floor. And then after that, they can decide what they want. You see states going different ways uh, because some states are are putting into a statute a right to release, even though it's not required by the Constitution. Hmm. And, and the so problem that, I have is when you when you give somebody a right to release, that ties the hands of judges so they can't address gangs, career criminals, or organized crime because 
they have the same right to release as a poor person. And that's where I have a problem. When you take away the discretion of the trial court or where you're, even if you're saying, okay, it's, you know, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They're, they've got a, they're, they've got a genuine concern. But when you take that concern and tie the hands of judges so that they can't address real crime problem, well, then, then it's, it's not doing what it was intended to do. It needs to be, it's not, it's not accomplishing its purpose. So how do we how do we prevent that? Like, does this does this need to be a you know a, a Supreme Court opinion and toward it? No, I don't think so because yeah. I, I I agree. Yeah. Release just on that. No, I mean, the cost. I mean, the Supreme Court. I, I think the Constitution sets the floor, and the problem is where we're having people go crosswise is when they decide to go and above the floor, which they can do whatever they want. I think we've got some political issues that we've got to resolve as a society. I, I think we're going through the same cycle that we went through in the 60s. In the oh, yeah. 1960s, we felt safe. We we were more forgiving on our criminal laws. More people got out of jail. Crime started increasing. We started having a pushback. But the one side of the elector or one side of the political spectrum would not agree to, ch uh, to change it. So we had a backlash. We got Reagan elected. And then we had the war on drugs and the war on crime. And uh, we seem to be repeating that cycle currently. We're in the middle of the people are pushing back. And uh, one side of the spectrum is saying no. And you're seeing uh, the edges of their uh, uh, coalition fraying. Uh, you've got the NAACP in Oakland calling for a, uh, um, a state of emergency on crime and attacking their local elected officials that they all supported when they were running for election. So you're seeing a, a split in their coalition. And it, it, as crime continues, that coalition will split even more because the very people they claim to be wanting to help is the ones getting hurt the most by what they're doing. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, um, we're, when we're having this conversation, we're pretty much referring to career criminals, people, repeat offenders. That, that's, that's pretty much what we're, we're talking about for the most part, right? Well, yeah, I think we have, I mean, I, yes, I describe it in our urban areas. We have a city within the city and the, we have a small group that's committing the vast majority of the crimes. We know who they are, and th they have criminal histories. And when we elect policies or when we en enact policies that are charge-based release that we'd have no discretion, we have to release them, they see that as a green light to commit more crime. And the people living in the gray areas between the law and order people and the city of crime within the city, you know, they start, uh, well, look, if they can get away with it, I'm going to join the crime city. So we need this level of accountability so that the people living in the gray area are going, I'm going to follow the law. Uh, but yeah, we have a small group in our urban areas that are committing a, a large percentage of the crime. And the police know who they are. Y'all know who they are. Y'all are rearresting the same people a lot of the time. Yeah, I know there's been people who we have recently arrested and for example violation of protective order mm -hmm. when there was a violent crime committed in the very beginning assault family violence they receive a, pr a protective order and that person reoffends three four different times and they go in and they just keep getting Mm -hmm. And they just keep getting out, keep getting out. And so they go back over to the house and they're going to they're going to reoffend because they're not supposed to be over their protective order still in place. They um, which gives them another opportunity to because that relationship, you know, if you're if you're beating on your wife or your or, or spouse or whatever, that relationship isn't repaired from the time you've gone to jail. You're just probably more pissed off about it. So you go back over there because you got five thousand dollar bond, you know, six, seven thousand dollar bond, whatever it may be. And you go over there and, and that's when catastrophe can happen. And so I think, you know, there's got to be, uh, I agree, there's got to be accountability. Now, uh, I'll put a spin on it too and, and get your take on this. We do a lot of wrongful conviction stories uh, on this podcast. And so we've had people who were, you know, behaved in a, a, 
had a lot of criminal activity before they got arrested for something they did not do. And they have a bill that's set excessively because of their past for, for, for something they, they did not commit. And some may say, well, just leave it to the court system to play out because if they're innocent, then it'll, it'll, it'll come out that they're innocent. Well, that's not necessarily the case that, you, you know, we all know that that doesn't always happen. Uh, what is your take on that? Well, I think the system, I mean, the system can commit errors, but I'm, I, I do believe that the criminal justice system that we have in the United States is the fairest of the ones that are being used in the world. Now, we always, it could be more fair. Absolutely. We always are looking for ways to improve it. But the problem we have is when we we put a layer of politics on top of something, it never ends up in good. But I mean, I have, a, you know, I, I can tell you a really bad story from the bell world. I mean, I have a friend that went on a cruise and, and left Galveston. And when they came back to Galveston, she was getting off the boat and they told her that she had a warrant for her arrest. Well, long story short, in this little podunk town close to me in Smith County, they had uh, a, a employee stealing stuff from a, a Dollar General store. And the police investigated it and uh, requested a warrant and was granted a warrant. And when they entered in on the system, they pulled up a name similar to hers that had a different date of birth and tied the warrant to that person, which turned out to be my friend. And that was not the person who committed the crime. She was taken to the Galveston County Jail and she was set at no bond. That's what the warrant said, no bond. And so they were telling her, we can't even grant you a bond. We, You're going to have to wait till this other county comes to get you. And takes you back to their county, and then you go before the district court judge, and he will grant you bail. Or, and that'll be at least within the next 10 days, Because, and if they don't come within the next 10 days, we'll just release you. And the only reason why we got her out of jail quickly was through personal relationships. We got the first assistant DA in that county to go look at the file over the weekend and compare the date of birth, the fingerprints, the pictures they had of the uh, perpetrator versus this woman who looked completely different, who was a mother of three kids and uh, was a housewife. And she found out very quickly that she agreed it was the wrong person and they withdrew the warrant. But, you know, we have in Texas, we, uh, we passed SB6 two legislative sessions ago. And one of the things that did is uh, it, it impacted warrants. And if you put a bond amount, if you put a bond amount of no bail today on a, a warrant that's not set out in the Constitution as one that you can deny bail, they would take you before the uh, uh, magistrate wherever you're arrested and you would be issued, granted bail. So if that happened, if her situation happened today and her warrant said no bond, they would take her before a magistrate in Galveston and the Galveston magistrate would set bail and she would be get get out of jail that day. Uh, if she could afford it. Um, and so I, I do think we're we're looking to improve the system whenever we can, when we find issues that need to be improved. But I still have faith. I mean, you know, look, I went to the, to law school 30-something uh, years ago to study, to, to be an attorney, and so I study the law, and I have faith in, in our system of justice. I have faith in juries. I have faith that, by and large, the, the system works. So, uh, yes, there are mistakes that are made, but uh, I don't think there's a better system in the world. I would I would uh, agree and, and, and disagree. Maybe we just have a different at interpretation, right, on it. Um, I would agree that the way that our criminal justice system was designed, so like the foundation of it would be the best and um, fair system compared to what you would see in other countries. I, I, but I would, I, would not, I would not say that right now, today, our system is the fairest because of what you just said, it's, it's, it's weaponized and it's political, you know, it's, there's so much politics involved in it. And, you know, I, we talk about, you know, um, like this, the whole catch and release. I mean, that's, that, 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 that's a political driven decision that was made and put into place by, um, I, I think it goes back to 
it's important for us to always try to like find these things that we can wor work on today and improve on today. Right. Because that's, that's all you got to take small steps to get, to get there. Um, so we don't need to lose track of that, but also with understanding that there is a bigger problem across the country and society. And in my opinion, the criminal justice system is, um, uh, one of the biggest driving factors in, in, in that. And how so? Well, I, I think that because if, if you were to turn on the, the news, I mean, right now, or, you know, every, every major issue that's being discussed, in, in my opinion, um, t today, you can tie that back to the criminal justice system somewhere, right? So, like, yeah. um, all the personal um, prosecutions or the policies or the crime or just everything, it all has to do with, with the criminal justice system. And I think that it's been – that system has been utilized not – in the interest of justice. And I think that the, the country and society is so lost at, um, the, well, sy the I system, do think we go through cycles. The system being so divided. So like you said, back in the sixties, you know, you go through these cycles. I think right now we're in such a, uh, a place in society where we're so divided politically. Right. Um, and that is impacting the criminal justice system because that's what's getting, people who are in positions to create legislation into power to do that and create these policies that in return is hurting society. If that makes any, you know, if you're trying to, I think we have a lot of friends on the, on, on the side of the spectrum. That's not, that doesn't agree with me, but I think we're starting to see a lot of them realize that what they're doing is harming society and it's, it's impacting public safety where they are right now though, is, they're not willing to do anything about it because if they do, somebody will run against them. Uh, they'll lose all their fundraising or they'll lose all their campaign contributions. And so everything you know is being driven to the extremes, but you're seeing that start to fray. And when the NAACP in Oakland is calling for a state of emergency on crime, you, you cannot deny, like they did in the last election, that really crime was not increasing. That was just a myth from from the opposite side of politics. And so I don't think you can say today that crime is not increasing or has not increased in our urban areas. And so I think, you know, we I agree with you. We need to get politics out of the criminal justice system. But the problem is we're a democracy or a republic, whatever you want to call it. And so to a certain level, we're going to have some politics in it, and we have to minimize that as much as possible. But that's politics is the reason why we have these cycles. And, and because the 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 coalition on the left is not made up of just one group that wants to decriminalize crime. It's not made up of just one group of social justice warriors. It's it's made up of a whole group that have, I mean, different groups that have different um, goals. And so once we start having more crime in our urban cities, then you're going to start seeing the coalition fray, which is what's happening now. That's the reason why New York has pulled back. Uh, or roll back their reforms at least three or four times now. You've seen like Alaska uh, repeal their reforms, and you see other states that are putting limits on on these things. You, Texas, when they passed SB six, they were going in the opposite direction. They were strengthening accountability and uh, rejecting uh, th this uh, these bad bail reform policies. And so you're seeing more of it. I mean, you're seeing that this fight get even harder. You look look at what Chicago just did or Illinois. I mean, they've doubled down on on crime, really, if you look at what they've done. Uh, but uh, so I think you, you're correct in the sense of we still have these state by state political ballot, uh, battles and, that are deeply impacting crime and they're deeply impacting uh, uh, the public safety. And we need to get politics out of that as much as possible. Uh, but we're in this period where that's driving the, the policies. And I don't know how to get. Um, I don't know how to get uh, politics out of crime or crime policy, um, but we eventually will. I mean, the, my 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 um, you know my last word on that is we eventually will because what's going on right now is not sustainable.
And since it's not sustainable, there will be a force that will push a resolution at some point. Because if if the public can't get public safety, you can't get it through law enforcement, they'll have vigilante justice. We already see that happening at times. And so there'll be, I mean, we what's going on is not sustainable. So it will come to a day where we will um, find a solution to this problem. I would agree. And, I, you know, I'll be honest, I think, I think we're, we're not far from it. Um, just because of the reasons that, that you said, and, you know, I, I would love to get politics out of the criminal justice system, but here's the reality. Politics is what kind of makes the criminal justice system in the sense that the people elect the officials that are put in the positions within the criminal justice system. And that goes down to politics. Um, well, the legislature passes the laws on what com what becomes a crime, and then and then uh, judges uh, and prosecutors just decide who to prosecute uh, on the, on those crimes. And so, uh, you know, we see. I mean, Harris County right now is is driving policy statewide in Texas. And so, in the last legislative session, there was a little bit of a pushback, or probably a bigger pushback than that, on the rest of the county saying, why do we have to freaking change what we're doing because of Harris County? Why can't Harris County just do it right? Well, because uh, it's the third largest county in the United States, and it's uh, being pushed by one man in politics really heavily into the wrong direction, and they convinced a federal judge to agree with them, and she's now been reversed seven or eight times, and they're still following the settlement that was reached in that case, even uh, enforced upon the county, even though the Fifth Circuit has now ruled that case should have never been filed in federal court. And the settlement that was reached is everybody is a charge-based release mechanism system on misdemeanors. And until that local rule is set aside, and it should be, just needs to get an avenue to the Fifth Circuit, and it, it will be set aside. But until somebody's willing to do that, politics will continue to uh, govern misdemeanor release in, in Harris County. Well, Ken, so this podcast, you know, I don't know what you know about the history of it. So um, we are cops. I've been a cop for um, going on 15 years. Uh, Preston here, I actually trained him when he came onto the force. Yeah, I've just been a cop since breakfast, so <laughs> it's not been that long. And, you know, um, for for so many years, I was the guy, I was a major crimes detective, you know, I worked homicides, uh, child sex crimes. I've put a lot of people in jail, but for so long I was, you know, I, I think in my mind I showed up, I went to work and I wanted to do the right thing. And I completely ignored anything around me, like as far as politics, there was a lot of things behind the scenes, especially when I, you know, I was a street cop. I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. I, when I was a, a detective, I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. But as I started to kind of rise up and in, uh, in the ranks and I started to see kind of what was going on in the, in, in the politics involved with some of the criminal justice decisions that were being made, um, I started to see uh, – and I have no problem speaking on it because um, – I don't necessarily expect you to respond. I have no qualms about saying, you know, I was in Anderson County. I experienced a lot of corruption in Anderson County, all the way from the police chief to police officers on the street to judges to the current district attorney there. And um, I called it out. There were some there were some things going on. Uh, my very first episode of this podcast discussed uh, why I ended up on the on the journey to leave law enforcement for two years. Um, because uh, the DA tried to prosecute somebody that shouldn't have been prosecuted, and I stood up for it, and then I had a target on my back at that point, and I uncovered so many other things. And so I say all that to say there – for the longest time, I didn't think those things existed. And then once I started to see it and it, and it, and it was brought before my eyes and I started being impacted by it, I opened my eyes more and I was like, okay, this stuff's going on more than you realize. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, I would like to think, um, now I'm back in law enforcement. I was out for two years, uh, got back in, in, in May of, of 23. So, you know, six, seven, eight months I've been back in it, but my perspective has changed. 
because I am all about, you know, that's the name of this podcast, Failing Justice. I feel like justice has failed so many people. I've met so many good people, I say this all the time, who have been just wronged by the system. And I think a lot of it uh, falls back on to, to politics, right? And me and Preston talk all the time on this podcast. We say, I think we can take, we can, we can put all this in a bucket and carry it to the, to the finish line of this. I think that if you just had good people mm -hmm. who had the interest of justice with a good heart and a good mind to want to do what is right in all of these positions, we wouldn't be where we are today with all of these problems. I mean, at some point we have veered off track and we can, we can talk for hours and hours on, on what that may have may be, but you, you know, know this, this, is something, this is really kind of something that hits me pretty hard because, you know, I mean, aren't we really talking about people who are missing a moral compass? That's exactly yeah. It. That that's that. You're, you're exactly right. The, the, I'm doing lost. a podcast tomorrow with the sheriff of Hidalgo County, and every sheriff before him, probably for quite a few, have been left office in scandal because of corruption issues. And I, and I'm not really sure about how many there were, but I mean, the last sheriff, the one that he replaced, was uh, resigned on corruption issues, and so. Um, when you have corruption, I mean, I, I look at that when you, you or me is faced with corruption, what, what do you do? And I, I go to, I go to what's your moral compass? I mean, I think your moral compass said, yeah, I've got to stand up for what I believe is right. And, you know, I have this saying that I use when, uh, when I'm in a difficult situation and I have to talk to people and I'm like, when in doubt, just stick to the facts. Don't try to soften it. Don't try to harden it. Just stick to the facts because the facts are the facts. Um, when you have issues of you question somebody, what they're doing, whether it's political, whether it's being a corruption, you know, you have to stick with your moral compass. Um, otherwise you won't be able to live with yourself. And so I think we would be doing so much better as a society, we wouldn't have be having a lot of these issues that we're having on bad bell reform if people had a moral compass. But uh, I don't know how you teach morals uh, without teaching religion, because um, I, I watched a movie recently or a clip of a movie where it said, you know, morals, uh, teaching morals without religion is someone's it's just your opinion. It's your opinion you should not steal. And so that they may have a different opinion of you, but that's just a, 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 an opinion. But when you interplay um, a, a religious element to it, like in you know Alcoholics Anonymous that believes in a, a, a supreme being, that's so successful as a, a treatment for alcoholism and other other uh, drug issues because it has this uh, moral compass that it teaches with an overlay of of a, of a supreme being. So I think that's part of the problem that we have is we have this. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a um, we have a whole group of our society that is missing a moral compass, and and in in its and in its place is envy. Uh, you have something I want; I should have it. I mean, I mean, I, if you look over the last twenty years, the the cases that I've seen where people have been shot at the courthouse are all family law related. They're not really anything else. I mean, even at the Court of Appeals in Fort Worth, when there was a shooting at the Court of Appeals, it was a family law case. So family law issues create mu much more problems. And we're talking in our other states of replacing law enforcement and bring and bring a mediator to those types of things. I mean, who's going to be responsible when those little people get shot and killed because you sent sent somebody that was ill-equipped uh, for that situation because those are the most violent situations. Yeah, that that that's absurd. I mean, you, you there there has to be rule of law. There has to be things in place. People can't just run around committing crime, uh, like you said, decriminal decriminalizing statutes. And and I mean, I think that is. Uh, I think we are on the same page there. That is that is completely absurd because we see that in law enforcement. I mean, even in um, uh, these metropolitan uh, 
urban counties, I mean, when we work in one, I, I'm not going to name it because we're active, but, you know, um, we even see it there. Uh, you know, go back to the example I, I, I mentioned earlier of, of the person that, that's been arrested for a violent crime, has a has a emergency protective order and just keeps going back, going back and committing the same crime over and over and over. And so I agree. I mean, there is most certainly a problem and I, and, um, when it comes to that. Um, but I, I also agree on the topic of the, you know, lacking a moral compass. And, and we talk about that all the time, uh, specifically in, in when it comes to, uh, law enforcement, you know, the criminal justice system, uh, as a whole, people just lack, um, a moral compass. And I don't know, I don't know where we, where we went sideways with it, but, um, it's in bad shape and there's a, there's a, so much work that needs to be done. And, um, I do have a question though, uh, and, and I wanted to ask it earlier and, and we, we moved along. Do you think that a lot of these stories that you hear, like you mentioned your friend who went on that cruise and I read about that story, but I didn't realize that was uh, close to East Texas. I remember reading that story. And so that's just one of, of, of many, right? You have, that's, I would call that an injustice, whether that was a clerical error, human error, whatever, yeah. still an injustice. Do you think, and, and the people we've had on the show that's been wrongfully convicted, all the people that I know that's been wrongfully convicted, people that has been wrongfully arrested. Do you think all of those injustices, um, that, that people, want to bring legitimate change and reform and maybe in the form of uh, bail reform, maybe that's their driving factor uh, to wanting to make those change, but maybe they're taking a little too far. Do you think I that? Will, you know, I it? call those people the true believers and I do believe the coalition pushing for b bad bail reform has a portion of their coalition, which I think are the true believers. But I think there's another group that's driving it, and I think it's the money group that's wanting to decriminalize a lot of crime. They don't want they they're wanting. Uh, I mean, they know what they're doing. They're doing harm to the criminal justice system. I mean, the weirdest argument or rumor that I heard was that Soros is funding a lot of this. He's cre wanting to create chaos because he makes his money through arbitrage systems, and so he makes more money through chaos. That you know, that's one of those that I kind of just put in the category of that's just too crazy not to too crazy to be true but there's a lot of things that were too crazy to be true that just have turned out to be true over the last four years and so you can't discount it i mean you, you have to question his motives when he's throwing money into a district attorney's race in texas uh, and and they're going to suddenly get elected and then they're going to be very progressive on crime suddenly they're not going to prosecute certain crimes anymore and and i just completely disagree with that yeah, I would. Yeah, I agree with that too. I mean, I. What I don't understand even more is you have a. You know, you'll have a district attorney's office that decides. Well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pros prosecute um, marijuana charges. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what. I'm not gonna prosecute them. All right. I, I guess you were elected to be the DA. There's nothing I can do about that. If your office doesn't move forward with these charges, right? That's that's out of my control. But what I don't understand is then you have police departments where you have leaders within those police departments will now turn around and tell their officers, you can't arrest on that. Mm -hmm. Why not? It, it's still a lawfully good arrest, right? But you have the you have leaders within police departments that will... I'll say we, cower, we need, down, cower down to we need to do whatever. something on our drug crimes and i'm i'm a firm believer in a strong uh drunk uh drug statutes because i have a sister who had a 30-year drug addiction to prescription drugs and could, we couldn't get her to do anything until late in life i ended up being her guardian and she lived in an assisted living facility where they regulated her medication but uh I'm I'm a strong believer in I mean I read an article one time that said 80% of all crime is some kind of offshoot from drug 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 trafficking or drug crimes and I really do believe that so I think if we're if we give up on that and quit prosecuting that we uh we're giving up on crime really but we've got the problem we have is on this marijuana issue we've got um 
I think a generation that doesn't believe that that should be prosecuted anymore. And so, you know, when they when we used to prosecute people for illegal abortions, we had lots of juries that would uh, nullify the law and just find somebody not guilty of having an illegal abortion. I think we're at risk of of having that same thing happen in our urban areas where if we were to prosecute and and uh, charge and prosecute somebody on marijuana, I think we're at the tipping point in some of our uh, cities where they would just nullify it and not and just find them not guilty. So we need to have that kind of conversation as a society. But right now, the lieutenant governor will not let any type of statute to repeal marijuana uh, crimes. He won't let that through the Senate. So we're kind of stuck. Yeah. So we can have that debate. We can't have that discussion. But I do agree with you. I don't. You should not be able to go to Montgomery County with the same level or, or amount of drugs in your pocket that you go into Harris County. Harris County, you won't even be prosecuted. Montgomery County, you'll be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. That undermines trust in the criminal justice system when you do that. And maybe- Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and, and this is unpopular, obviously, in this conversation. I think marijuana should be legal. But since it's not, and, and that's a whole topic, I picked a bad example to get to my point, guys. I'm sorry about that. No, so. because we, we, yeah, I, I, that's a whole nother conversation. And I could, we don't have time for that. And we, I could talk to you on the phone about that later. But um, m- my point is, it's exactly what you said. Since it is illegal, it's not okay to go to Smith County, be arrested for it, you know, and then turn around, go to Harris County, Montgomery County, wherever the, wherever it may be and not be prosecuted for it. When the same law is written in black and white on the books, I, I don't, I don't think that's okay. Well, I would, again, I, I used a bad, a bad offense to, to use this as my example, but you know, where I was going with that is, you know, the DA may or may not decide to take the case and, and, and prosecute. That's a, that's going to be up to the DA. So let's take it for theft. Uh, I mean, well, but let's look at what what's happened in Seattle or Portland, uh, where they um, in Oregon, where they've decriminalized all he- all heavy crime. I mean, all heavy drug crimes. So you know, so in Portland, you have an open. I mean, it's like an open opium den every day in downtown, and you have record numbers of people uh, overdosing every month. I mean, it's like we're giving up on a group in our, our society. We're we're saying, oh well, we're going to fund all these, uh, uh, all these uh, uh, plans for them that they can seek, but less than oh one percent are going to treatment plans, and so all that money, none of it's being used, and we're just, uh, and oh well, it's their decision. No, you have to have that to be a crime, so you have a hammer to send them to drug rehab, and we're giving up on that. We're giving up on a whole group of our society, and do you, you know if a record number is uh, overdosing every month that means the number of people using drugs in that area is growing every month it's just it's ridiculous that we would do that and i mean that's if you want to talk about corruption that's where i think there's a whole bunch of corruption going on because they're funding these treatment plans and none of them are being used so where's that money going and you right. know it's going in somebody's pocket yeah yeah just like uh i mean i i i think there's probably some some issues with um funding when it comes to the prison system too but yeah you you make a good point um i i definitely don't agree that you know if you, here's the thing about drug drug usage and like true addict addicts is like you know um you're gonna have to want to get that help mm-hmm. right so just because we can create legislation and say we're gonna decriminalize it and then but we're gonna take funding and put it into all these rehabs and give them these resources to use. Well, um, I, I hate to break it to people, but unless an addict wants to get clean, wants to get sober, right? They're, they're not going to do it because it's a personal decision they're making. Now, the studies show that there's a 75% failure rate for when somebody goes to a treatment. And so you've got to have a hammer against them the threat of prison to give them an incentive to go back to treatment because every time they go back to treatment, there's a 75% chance they will not be successful. And so you're just hoping that every time your 25% will be compounded and continue to grow. But if you don't have an incentive to 
if you don't have an incentive for them to want to go to rehab, drug rehab, they will never choose drug rehab. Yeah, because if they don't, if they don't see the consequences to their actions, you know, that's like, um, you know, me, I, I think I'm, I'm going on almost five years of sobriety from, you know, alcohol and, um, I, the, one of my main driving factors for, you know, completely, uh, giving up alcohol was I hit rock bottom in life, right? Like I saw the consequence of, and I had to wake up and go, well, do I want to lose everything or do I want to make a change in my life? And unfortunately, um, you know, that's not an easy decision for people. So, you know, having that still where, you know, if you're, if you're a, a drug addict and you, you're addicted to, I don't know. Well, kicking hair. alcoholism is considered one of the hardest things to do. And so, um, that's why I keep applauding, uh, AA if they're so successful, um, that we should be celebrating. We should be, uh, using other, their, their model in other areas as well. And we're not. And, and the reason why we're not is because it has a religious element. And, but the reason why we're not kicking it and getting rid of it is because it's so successful. Mm. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I have my own demons. Um, you know, I have, you know, my grandmother was, you know, had to be committed for a period of time because she was on so many medications. And so I've always thought, you know, I have this fear that, you know, I, I would easily jump into the, this pain medication world. So I've only had a very few surgeries. I've been very blessed, but I've always refused pain medicine. And, you know, the doctor said, oh, you don't, you don't have to be in pain. You don't have to refuse. And I'm like, I'm not willing to risk it. I've got a family history that I'm I'm watching, so I will take Tylenol number three, and that's all. Yeah, because it's so it's so addicting, and these pharmaceutical companies they come out with these prescriptions, and they get people hooked on it because that's it's all dollar signs and money, and then so you want to talk about the drug problem, you tie that back to politics. Why we're decriminalizing some of it is because you got lobbyists from pharmaceutical companies. It's a mess. And I think it goes back to our, I think our society's lost its moral compass. Sometimes I think that's, uh, that's a, a part of the issue. So I, I guess, what do you think the right direction for us to go with bail reform is if, we, if, you know, obviously we've, we've, we've covered a huge topic of what we think the bigger, problem is but obviously we got to do things uh in the meantime to be able to solve that bigger problem we got to take those small steps so well we have to realize first that a lot of these pushes for criminal justice reform and bail reform are not intended to make us safer i mean there are we teach criminology classes how many uh classes have y'all taken on uh Here's how you successfully fight crime. And normally, uh, one of the concepts of fighting crime is not, we will release half the people from prison and we will be safer. I mean, that is not a concept that any of our textbooks on criminology teach. And so we're, we have these groups that are arguing that, oh, we need to release more criminals and that will make us safer. No, it won't. I mean, if it doesn't sound cr true, if it doesn't pass the smell test, it's not true. Uh, and we need to go back to what we know that works. And what we know that works is, you know, concepts that made uh, New York very successful, broken window theory. Uh, that's not uh, a theory that was just used in, in creating Cal in New York or New York City. It was a tested and proven uh, theory of how to fight crime in our uh, criminology uh, textbooks. And so, uh, and honestly, you know, this, uh, no one, you know, there will be people that will dispute what I say, but I'm, I'm like, you need to use more of the private industry instead of less because we're the only one that has the lowest failure to peer rate and we have the highest level of accountability. You want to cut your backlog on cases, then you can cut it just by using more uh, private surety bonds. And, um, uh, and that's because we're so closely tied with the criminal justice system. We're intertwined. We're what's good for the criminal justice system is good for the private industry and vice versa. We're doing things consciously to harm the criminal justice system. And we know it. Look at everything. A lot of what you can see is, is traced back to California. California was not intended to decrease crime, not anything they did. They were, they were told to reduce their jail population in their prison because they couldn't provide 
uh, competent medical care. That case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, 5-4 decision, blah, blah, blah. But it was all, everything in there has been to reduce their their prison population because they don't have the political will to build, build more capacity. And so, of course, crime is going to increase in, in California. And everything that we've seen in California is exactly what you would expect to see if you had studied criminology. And so we need to go back to the principles of criminology that we know work. And that involves using more of the private industry for uh, getting people to go to court. And then once we start seeing crime go down, then we can start looking for ways to improve the system instead of these weird things that we're trying that never were tested, never were proven anywhere and are, fail are failing in a dramatic uh, fashion across the country. Yeah, I agree. I think the problem is just going to, like you said earlier, just building upon itself, just totally compounding. And it's a vicious cycle that um, at mm -hmm. some point, you know, we're, it, it's, it's going to change. It's got, it has to change. Um, I don't, I don't exactly know what that answer is. I think we could probably, we've talked about a lot of it, but I mean, you know, I, I would agree that there, there does have to be a real change. And, um, you know, I want to, I want to, uh, applaud you for, for your efforts. We appreciate you coming on the show. Well, I appreciate you asking me to come. And if, if people want to more, know more information from, uh, you know, um, what we're talking about, you can go to pbtx.com, which is the Professional Bondsman of Texas. That's their website. We have a blog. We also have our own podcast called The Bell Post. You can go, there's a link to it on our uh, menu, but there's also thebellpost.com. Uh, and we have a blog where we highlight important criminal justice studies or uh, stories in, in, across the country, uh, failures and what, what's working. And we also release studies or highlight studies of what, of, of failures, um, and when to get the truth out, because when, when you go to court and everybody's saying something you know not to be true and nobody else is saying it, then somebody has to. And right now that's us. Just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and thank you, uh, Ken, for coming on.